Good morning and welcome to worship today at First Baptist Church Farmville. It is a great day to have a homecoming, isn't it? Yes. As my, our uh, professor, uh, d- the dean of the Divinity School, where I went for seminary at Campbell University, um, he would always say on days like the day, it's a high and holy day. And so it surely is. Um, we also celebrate this year our 113th year of ministry. And so uh, it's, it's just a good day to be together. I hope that you're planning to stay for the cover dish lunch uh, that, that follows this service. Um, I do want to, uh, to, to share, because sometimes I forget these at the benediction time, uh, but we're going to have the prayer at the benediction time. But if I forget to say, help, please help remind me that there are some who've uh, come today who have uh, a little bit of mobility issues, and let's just be aware of them as we're transitioning to the fellowship hall in, you know, at the end of the service uh, to make sure we're, we're, we're giving them a, a, a lane to get through and, and, and helping uh, their assistance and such, okay? Um, do want to welcome those who are joining us online. We are, are, are thankful for your presence and welcome uh, to, to this time of worship. I'd like to encourage you to say hello in the comments section there and, uh, and hope that this will be a, um, a, an encouraging time for you as well as we worship this morning. I also like to say a, a word of welcome to visitors. Uh, we recognize that we may have some who've, uh, who have moved away and have come back and, and, uh, or maybe like distant relatives, but still kind of in the visiting mode today. We are, are so thankful for your presence with us today. Um, if there are those in our community who are visiting and um, you would like more information about First Baptist Church, please fill out a portion of this bulletin that can, can tear out. You can put that into um, our uh, offering plates. Uh, following the service, and we will uh, follow up with you this coming week. Additionally, this past uh, last Sunday, we had a deacons meeting, and uh, during that, we, we talked about um, communication and such, and, uh, and, and generally, when we send out emails, newsletters, um, and our, uh, our church cast phone tree calls that go out um, for special events, generally, those in, in the past have only gone to members of the church, but we want to broaden that to people who maybe aren't members yet, um, but you're here pretty regular. Um, If you are not in the communication circle yet, we want to give you an invitation to fill out this information and just turn it in, and we will add you to those different uh, lanes of communication, again, just to make sure that when special things are happening or, or maybe they're, you know, events that are happening that are, you know, we're trying to get the word out about, we want to make sure we're able to communicate to as many people um, and be effective in that. So uh, do know that this morning. For giving of tithes and offerings, you can do so by placing your tithes and offerings in the offering plates that are located on the sides of the stage and also in the vestibule. Um, additionally, you can give online at firstbaptistfarmville.org. And as always, uh, we appreciate all the ways that you give and contribute to the ministries here at First Baptist Church. Uh, by way of announcement, we have a few things this morning. Uh, the youth continue for the month of October doing their, their uh, canned food, um, gently used clothes, um, bedding, um, house, household items, uh, drive. And on November 6th, they're going to be delivering those to the Kennedy home. Also, on October 30th, which is a Sunday, uh, at 4 p.m., the youth are going to be going trick-or-treating for canned goods. So if you're going to participate in that, please call Nail during the week and make sure you're added to that list so the youth will know to swing by uh, your house on that Sunday afternoon. October 31st this year is on a Monday. And so we'll be having our trunk or treat that evening from 6 to 8 p.m. The theme is the Wizard of Oz. And uh, if you're interested in helping out um, with a trunk, um, there's a sign-up sheet that was located over there. It, it moves around. It has legs. It's still over there. Some, it's in that pile over there. So make sure that you uh, l- look at that and see where the needs are. We appreciate all the ways people have already signed up, and uh, there continues to be some need for that. And there's always a need for, you know, for what? Candy, I hear you. Here, the kids are excited about that one. There's always a need for candy. Even when we think we have enough, we're not even close, okay? So um, when you're doing your shopping this coming week, um, when you go by that candy aisle, most of us know to steer away from that. Look, you just go down it and, and get us some stuff and then bring it up here. You can have a piece or two if you want, but, uh, but we do need some of that candy here for uh, that ministry. So um, with that said, again, uh, we hope that you'll stay this afternoon for the Cover Dish Luncheon and look forward to that time of fellowship. But now as we begin this time of worship, I invite you to join your hearts with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the ways that you have richly blessed this community of faith for 113 years. We thank you that today as we celebrate our homecoming with this special time of worship, that we do so in in, in honoring and 
and giving you the praise and glory that you deserve. We thank you for all the ways that uh, the elements of this service will work together um, to, to give you that praise and glory. And we, we thank you that in the process of worshiping you, uh, you fill us up. And so uh, you, you, you give us joy and happiness. And we, uh, again, give you praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, there are two, two additional announcements. I, the, the Lord just told me I forgot while I was praying. Um, one is to welcome Collis Moore Jr. this morning to, to leading us in worship. And uh, we're glad that you're here to share of, of your talents and gifts. And uh, this, is, this is part of your home too, right, isn't it, brother? Um, I also want to share this morning, if there's a need for anyone to go into the nursery, it says TBD here, but my wife Gina is in the nursery to keep children. So do know that the nursery is down this hall. Um, keep going down and turn right around, and, uh, and you can find uh, where the kids are stored during the service. So, all right. <laughs> First, I want to say thank you for all the thoughts, prayers, cards. We have felt every single one, and we still need them. Um, so if, forgive me if I tear up a little bit. It's been a very emotional three weeks. In fact, this is the first time I've done anything other than leggings and T-shirts in three weeks. So um, just to give you an update, he's had a decent weekend. Um, he is responding to questions. He is aware of who people are. Um, and he's able to answer questions, questions with shakes of his head. He still um, has the wound on his leg, so we still have another couple of surgeries to deal with, um, with that with skin grafts and debridement of his leg and things like that. So we still have a long ways to go, but he is moving in a positive direction, so please keep your prayers coming. We have felt God's presence through every moment of these three weeks, and I'm sure we will continue to feel God's presence um, because that's the only way we've gotten as far as we have. So God has blessed us with all of y'all, all of our family, and just the miracles that he's already performed in Brian because he is a walking testimony for God. Um, so please keep those coming. We very dearly appreciate them. Thank you for supporting me and letting me be with him these last three weeks. And so he's at, actually at a place now where I can be here and join y'all this morning. So um, I'm very blessed to be here and be a part of this family. So thank you for that. Um, so now we're going to go into the call to worship. So if you will pull up, you get, uh, grab your bulletin and join me in the call to worship. How good and pleasant is it when all God's children get together? I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. In this time of worship, we unite as a family bound in Christian love under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. May our souls be blessed and our fellowship strengthened as we give God all that he deserves on this day. No matter where we go or how far we venture, it is always good to know that we can come home. We give God grace on this homecoming Sunday. Amen. Now if you'll all stand and join us in singing the hymn medley.
Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 17. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning as we gather for our homecoming and to celebrate 113 years of ministry, we must remember that 114 years ago, or maybe a little more than that, God put a dream in some people's hearts, didn't he? A dream to build a place to host a family, a family of faith. A family of faith that's endured wars, pandemics, natural disasters. A place where people have come together to grieve the mourning of loved ones, to celebrate the birth of new children and dedicating them to the Lord. A place where brothers and sisters beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ, have walked into the waters of baptism to have an outward show of their inward commitment to Jesus. Our church has a heartbeat that is older than all of us. A heartbeat that began 113 years ago here in Farmville. A heartbeat that will continue. When we gather together, we don't just gather as fellow human beings. We gather as brothers and sisters And in doing so, I think, just as Jacob realized here with his dream that God is in the places where we gather, God is in this place, God is at First Baptist Church. When we gather together, we might not always feel it to begin with, but eventually God brings us around to realizing that when we're together, we're touching heaven. This song that we're about to have have a claim sing for you, it's not a a song for you to just listen to, be entertained by, or anything like that. This is a song for you to worship with. It's a new song for many of us, and so what we're going to ask is that during this time, you remain seated. You may know this song and want to sing along. The words will be on the screen, but there are many ways that you can worship. One of the ways might be to reflect and give thanks for the ways that First Baptist Church has changed your life, for the people of faith that have gone before us, Maybe for some of you who've been here a lot longer than others, you can remember being in the nursery. You can remember growing up in Sunday school rooms. You can remember a a lot of things about the history of our church. This is a time to give thanks for the history that we have, but it's also a time to give thanks for what God is going to do in our future. And so that's what this time is for. I hope that it will be meaningful as you see that the flesh that God has put your soul in And the way that you're here is physically as part of this and bonded spiritually through the Holy Spirit that you are part of the heartbeat of First Baptist Church as well. So let us worship. Yeah. 
Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much for the life of our church. We call this home and we thank you so much for the ways that it's the home models uh, us, molds us, helps us become the people we're called to be. We thank you for brothers and sisters, spiritual mothers and fathers. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for him being the head of the church, the head of the body. We thank you for the many ways that he leads us to being individuals who have great potential for you and purpose in life. We thank you for the ways we get to live into that. We thank you for the people you put a dream into their hearts and minds to start a, a, a missionary church here in the Farmville community that began 113 years ago. And Lord, we pray that, that if it's over a, 113 years or 1,013 years, whenever you come back, we pray that this church will continue until that time to be on the mission that you've called us to be on. Lord, we pray that we can find our, our place in helping that happen. That we can be part of your resiliency here at First Baptist Church. That we can be that kind of a church that always preaches the gospel, that always leads people in worship and service of you. For not only decades, but for centuries. We thank you for the work you've done in us and continue to. Lord, as we seek you this morning, we also bring that portion of our family to you that we keep on our prayer list uh, for men and women who, who need a touch of, of healing in their lives. And Lord, we pray uh, for miracles in their lives when there, where there's a need for that. We pray for your movement and for your healing. And we pray that, uh, it, that it will come fast. And Lord, we pray that you'll show us how we can be your hands and feet of love and grace and peace in people's lives. Uh, we pray for those who also grieve in this season, uh, who've lost loved ones in the past months or years. And uh, we thank you that we can hold all of these emotions. We can hold emotion, emotions of joy and excitement, but also grief in the same person. We can, we can experience all those things and yet do so and, and get through it together as a family and through the Spirit's leading. So Lord, as we worship on this high and holy day, uh, we remember you and we remember the ways that you taught your disciples to pray. And we pray now, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Zacchaeus, you come down. Oh, I'm going to your house today. Oh, I'm going to your house today. Good morning. What a great job you did. Thank you so much for sharing that song with us, and I think everyone really liked hearing you sing. Thank you, and we're glad to have you today, too. I wanted to talk to you just a moment this morning about a very special place. It's a place called home. We all have one. We're very lucky in that. I think home is very, very important for us, so I'm not going to make you talk or ask you to talk a little bit uh, too much, but I wanted to ask you, what do you like about coming home at the end of your school day? I get to play outside. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Can you think of something? Um, what do you like about coming home at the end of your school day? Getting that bed flushed. Okay. Flopping down the lot on the couch. Flopping down on the couch, my kind of girl. Okay. Playing with my boat playing with your boat. So we all have things that we enjoy doing when we come home, regardless of our ages. For some, it's flopping down on the sofa, playing outside, getting a snack, looking at our phones, all kinds of things that we do when we get home. And all the people who live in your home, whether you're the only child in your home or whether you have brothers and sisters or whether you have grandparents living in your home or other people living in your home and sharing it with you, they are all your family, right? Okay. And everybody who lives in your home, I hope everybody who lives in your home loves you very much, and they help teach you right from wrong. They spend time with you. They laugh with you. Uh, they share meals with you, and they tell you good night when you go to bed. All very nice things. Family is important. You are very lucky because you have a second family. Did you know that? You do know that? Who is your second family? God and Jesus. God and Jesus. God is our Father, and he tells us in the Bible that all of us who follow Jesus Christ are the children of God. So we are all a family. Your church has a really big family. So I want you to stand up here with me for a moment. So you're not the only one standing up. We're all standing up. You can stand up too, Holly. We are all standing up. Come stand up with me and turn around and look at all of these people in church today. Wow. There are people upstairs. There are people downstairs. There are people behind you in, in the choir loft. These are all your church family. These are all children of God. They love you. They care about you. They want to teach you about Jesus and how Jesus lived. So these are very important things. They always want to take care of you, and they're always happy to see you. Good job. If you stand up, we're going to say a little prayer. You can stay standing, and when I say the line, I want you to say it after me, okay? So let's say a prayer. Dear God, Dear God. thank you for my family. And thank you for my church family. Thank you for my church family. And that I am a child of God. That I am a child of God. Amen. Amen. Okay, you can go with Miss Amanda now to Kingdom's Kids. Good morning. I'll be reading from the New Testament reading, Acts 2, 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was, was filled with awe 
at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved.
to the congregation. We want to encourage you to uh, meet and greet and say hello to the folks around you. And when the music ends, that's the, the, the sign that that time is coming to an end. Okay. So say hello. Where is she? Catherine. 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 I, that was good. Thank you once again to our choir for your leadership today. Thank you to Collis uh, for your leadership in worship. Um, thank you to our little children for uh, the way they sang. And of course, acclaim uh, leading. It's, uh, again, it's a high and holy day. It's a good day to be together. Every day is a good day to be together, but today is extra, extra special as we gather and, and celebrate coming home. Resilience. The ability to withstand will recover quickly from difficult circumstances. The ability to recoil or spring back into shape after bending, stretching, or being compressed. Have you ever heard of resilience? Human beings are here today because of it. You know, we were created in the image of God. We were put in a garden, a garden called Eden. We had perfect relationship with God, and then all things came crashing down when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There were punishments, and so as a result of that, they had to leave the garden. And after leaving the garden, they faced all kinds of hardships. Predators came after them. They had to be resilient when they faced danger. Think about human Humans had to be resilient when they faced sickness. I was thinking of it, the, this, the way I write a sermon, I start at the beginning of the week putting all of these things into my heart and mind doing a lot of uh, praying and reflection, and it's just this continual process. And so on uh, Friday afternoon, I was doing some yard work, and I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, you know, who was the first person who thought, man, people are getting sick because of something. We should do something about this. So let's mix some herbs up and figure out medicines. Human beings are resilient. Think of countries who have been ravished by war and the way that they have bounced back. I spoke a few moments ago about the 113 years of First Baptist Church's ministry and as I mentioned pandemics that the world has faced and war that the world has faced. We think about economic trials, ups and downs. We all have to be resilient. As I've prayed about over the past few weeks, the message that I might have for our church today, that's the one that God gave me. The church, the resilient church. Resilient churches, though, are not just resilient because they happen to be. They're resilient because they're made up of men and women, brothers and sisters. They're made up of Christ followers, of Christians who are resilient. Resilient Christians live life with wisdom. This morning we have a few different selections, and the first of scriptural selections. And the first comes from Ephesians Chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, where Paul writes, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Has anyone ever done anything foolish in here? Anybody? I want to share with you something mighty foolish that I did yesterday. If you're a friend of ours on Facebook... You saw that, that Luke had a big day yesterday morning. He shot his first deer. So we've been working on this. He, he's taking the hunting and is enjoying it. And so I'm trying to coach him along. And 
Normally, when we go out and do target practicing and everything, we, we have ear protection on, and um, you know, we're, we're doing all the things that we need to do necessarily. We're practicing gun safety, teaching all of those things. And so, Saturday morning, we got up, yesterday morning, we got up really early, and we ate some Pop-Tarts, which might not have been the, the best meal for a little kid at that, for Luke and Levi at, you know, 5.30, 5.45 in the morning. But anyway, it's what we had, it's what we ate. And um, we set out to walk a, about 500 yards through a bean field. Uh, Levi was convinced that he didn't ne- need, to wear wa- uh, need to wear socks, so he's wearing his Crocs. Anybody a Croc person? How about Crocs with socks? I tried to get him to wear boots, but he didn't want to wear the boots with socks. So then his socks, he, didn't, he doesn't like socks with Crocs. It was just Crocs. Anyway, so it's just a whole morning, y'all. If you've ever been hunting with a little kid, you know how it is, right? It's a morning and, or an evening or whatever. And so... We, here we are traipsing out. I'm carrying, you know, three chairs, a, a, bipod, a, a little field pod thing that holds the gun on. I've got the gun strapped on me. Luke's carrying a little uh, bag that's got some of our hunting things and snacks in it. And then Levi's just traipsing right along with his, he's sockless with Crocs on. So uh, we're, we get out there. We finally make it to the blind. We get everything set up and it's a waiting game. A few weeks ago, I put some corn out about 70 yards away and and have a feeder there and a little camera. We've been taking pic- about 2,000 pictures in the past two weeks of these four deer. Two does and then two younger ones. We're not going to call them their babies, okay? But, but they might be the babies. Okay, and so anyway, they come and they eat the corn and everything. And so we had the gun set up right there. And wouldn't you know it, about 20 minutes after the sun rises, the four deer come out in the total, totally different area, okay? And they're, they're jogging, okay? They're jogging across this 70-yard opening. And by the time we see them, when we try to pivot the gun, pivot everything, get Luke set up, the first one, which is the, a big one, has gotten into the woods. The second one, which is a big one, has almost gotten into the woods. And to the two little ones, they're safe this year, okay? So I'm like, Luke, you got to go now. So literally like seven seconds worth of time from the time we saw him to getting him turned around. And guess what I didn't do? Didn't put my earplugs in. Okay, Levi saw what was happening, and he put his little fingers. He was probably able to get them like two inches down in his ear. I mean, you've seen little kids' fingers, right? I mean, they're like little, they're like little Q-tips. I mean, he's just like, Doom! I mean, so he's good. Generally, when you're shooting the gun, if those of you who've been around hunting, if you're usually if you're shooting, the way that sound travels, it goes away from you, so you don't, it doesn't really blast you too bad. So he didn't have it on, but I was sitting there, right, kind of right off. Luke's right here. I'm right off his shoulder, kind of helping steady him a little bit. And when he pulls the trigger, the whole blind expands like, whoop, like just I see all the windows kind of go up as I'm watching the deer get shot. I'm seeing this out of my periphery. And, um, and all of a sudden, it's like a rain shower has happened. You know how a tent material, you're not supposed to touch the tent, right, when you go camping? Because we're soaking wet. He, he ends up hitting the deer. But from that moment on until this moment that I'm speaking to you right now, I have this ringing in my right ear that will not go away. That will not go. So I told, got home and told Gina, it's ringing in my ear. She said, you have earplugs in. I said, no. She said, you're an idiot. <laughs> and she's absolutely right. And if she, could have easily, she could have easily quoted Proverbs 14, 12 to me. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. You've heard that scripture, right? Proverbs 14, 12. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 again says, Be very careful how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You know, we're told that a wise way of living is to pursue the American dream, to pursue maybe being you know, the fan of the right team or have the right career path or whatever else might, we might think matter to us to truly bring satisfaction. And I'm not saying those things aren't important. It's important to have a career path that we're well suited for, that we add value into the world. It is okay to have entertainment in our lives and to enjoy following our sports team. I don't know if you heard, but state season's over, right? State fans, our, quarter, our quarterback's gone. You've got, you got to be able to throw the ball. Let me ask you this morning, does Jesus satisfy your soul? Do you know Jesus to satisfy your soul? Because that's the way that we're supposed to live in a wise manner. I find myself every now and then getting out of sync with that. Don't we all have that? Even the most devout among us 
Aren't there times we get so kind of holding so tight to the things around us? Maybe to worrying about our homes, worrying about, you know, the, the way we look to other people that we forget that the, the most wise way to live is in relationship to Jesus Christ. Resilient Christians know that they are to live their lives in a manner that is wise because once an opportunity is gone, that opportunity is gone, isn't it? I, I remember early in my ministry having opportunities, and, and early as being a Christian, having opportunities to say a word. You, you know how we pray, God, get, you know, put me in a position and give me a word to, to give a test, you know, testify to you, give a testimony about you, about your goodness. And I would, I would find myself getting into those situations. And I, I remember in high school and having a, a youth minister and, and, and people in the church who would kind of coach us on, you know, how, how to do those things. But I was kind of timid and I was kind of afraid. And when I was given an opportunity to speak up for the Lord, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of hold it in and I'd say, okay, I'm going to have another opportunity later. And guess what? Another opportunity didn't always come, did it? We need to live our lives in such a wise way that we make the most of the opportunities that God puts before us and not to live foolishly. Again, resilient churches are made up of resilient Christians who live life with wisdom. Secondly, resilient Christians rely on the strength of God. One of my favorite verses in the scripture is Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. Perhaps you've heard verse 13. You've heard me talk about the coffee mug verses before. Those verses that are good to put on a coffee mug or on a bumper sticker or on a, you know, uh, uh, a T-shirt. And I, I remember uh, growing up, uh, I used to like Duke basketball, okay? Um, that was before I went to NC State. And of course, now, you know, it's kind of, well, I'm an NC State fan, but I'm never going to be a Carolina fan. It's just not going to happen, okay? But I remember this guy, J.J. Reddick. Y'all remember him? He used to have all these records for three-pointers and then all, you know, all of the consecutive free throws made. And I remember him going through his thing, you know, he rolled the ball a certain way, dribbled a certain way, and then he'd say to himself in his mind, Philippians 4.13. And he'd remind himself of that scripture. And those of you who are Carolina fans, I see you shaking your head. Look, he's, it doesn't mean he's a demon or anything, okay? He, he, he was quoting that scripture. That was meaningful to him. You hear that all around, though. All around, uh, we've got some sports players up there. Y'all play, we got, I know we've got some soccer, some baseball. You ever hear somebody in, in like a, in a ra, you know, pet rally or something like that, or maybe to rally your team up? Remember Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can shake your head either way. They're just going to stare at me, okay? <laughs> I might have just woke the youth guys up. Welcome to the service. Welcome to homecoming. <laughs> but I remember hearing it like that. But I never heard, I never heard the full context where Paul says in, uh, in, in verse 12, he says, I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. It's an all right thing to quote a scripture in the context of a sporting event or, or, or you know, a, a situation where we, we need some sort of strength right, like that. But we need to remember the context that Philippians 4.13 was written. Paul, a person who really had it easy until he became a Christian, have you ever noticed that? You know, he, he, he was esteemed as a, as a Pharisee. He, he was the one, who, you know, his job, he was to go around and to persecute Christians. And he probably had it pretty easy when he came back to you know, to the camp and reported, you know, his findings and his work. I mean, they probably, you know, gave him a really nice seat of honor where he could sit and he could be served and he could be well fed. But when he converted to Christianity, his life really started falling apart from the outside. But on the inside, he was being renewed day by day, wasn't he? He was being renewed to the image of Christ. And there was nothing, there was nothing that he, someone could give him or pay him there was, there was not enough to get him to go back into that old life. And I read it again. He says, I know what it is to, to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Again, resilient Christians rely on God's Strength. There's a way to live our lives and rely on our own strength, and it just never is enough, is it? It just never is enough. I told you this past Friday I did some yard work. And y'all, y'all, most of y'all have seen the house. We live a couple blocks over here on East Horn Avenue, and this is the first house that we've lived in, uh, Gina and I, 
that has trees. Okay, and we, look, we just weren't prepared for last fall, okay? I'm telling you, it was overwhelming. Most Sunday mornings, I had blisters all over the place. And uh, I was, this year, I said, we got to do something different. And so they had a nice craftsman leaf backpack leaf blower on sale at Lowe's. And this past week, I bought that sucker. And I bought a little tank of gas that goes with it, and I fired it up on Friday. And I did like 20 hours worth of work in two with that leaf blower, Okay. There's a strength that, that I needed to adjust my life and my expectations. and I, I needed to pay a little bit of money to buy, a, to, to buy something that would actually make the job a, little, a whole lot, not a little bit, a whole lot easier. Sometimes we do that same thing in our lives, don't we? We forget the hard work of abiding in Christ, which is hard work. It is hard work to say no to the things of this earth. It is, it, it is hard work to say no to the opportunities that we have around us all the time. You've probably heard, and I remember them telling us in seminary, they say, you know, things are changing in the world. We see that Wednesday nights and Sundays are not reverent to the world anymore. You know, it used to be that everything was designed, our whole, our whole lives were designed so that, you know, basically Wednesday nights there was nothing going on because church was going on. Then on Sundays, all days, nothing was going on because that was the Lord's day. But now we have a lot of opportunities. There are a lot of things. And, and, and just because we're involved in a thing on a Sunday or a Wednesday does not mean that we're irreverent toward God. It's an opportunity, in fact, to go and be the hands and feet around people uh, who might not know Jesus. Amen? Amen? Okay. Um, you know, there's, there's probably going to come a day, my little boy Luke, he loves baseball. Okay, and he's not into he's he's been invited to get on a couple of little eight year eight year travel teams, and we're like, look, it's just the time's not right. But there might be a day that that time comes, and on a Sunday, Gina might be out traveling somewhere and, and playing baseball on a Sunday. But you know what? Our our family is going to be coached up and trained to still have a, a time of worship and devotion on those days. Amen. Amen. So 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 we're we're gonna we're we're gonna say, you know what? The world is changing, but that doesn't mean that. God has changed. In fact, and that doesn't mean that, that the church has to just sit back and relax and die in any way or atrophy in any way. In fact, these are opportunities, brand new opportunities that have not been presented to us to go and be the hands of feet, hands and feet of Jesus in the world. But we can't do those things if we rely on our own strength, right? We've got to spend the time with the Lord in devotion of the Lord, drawing close to the Lord, to the Lord worshiping the Lord so that we can rely upon his strength. It's not just going to come to us. It's not just going to come to us through osmosis, put our Bible on the nightstand. I sleep near my Bible, so some of that Leviticus has got to get in there. Okay? That's going to one one day that's we're going to do a, a study through Leviticus here. It's, it's going to be fun. I can't wait, okay? But not yet. Okay. I know some of y'all are like, what we're going to do here at church? Leviticus? Mm-mm. Okay. One day we're going to do a, a series through Leviticus, and I can't wait. It's going to be good. Anyway, Graham, stay focused. Are y'all, anybody taking notes? Uh, we got Shauna who's taking notes. Anybody else taking some notes? I'm going to review real quick. We, Sandra's got some notes going. Resilient Christians live, with wisdom, live life with wisdom. They rely on God's strength, and they know that hardships are revealers. Look at a neighbor and tell them, hardships are revealers. Tell, them, tell somebody. Someone needs to hear that. Hardships are revealers. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 12 say, We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Tell somebody you're not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. So tell somebody they don't have to be in despair this morning. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. Tell somebody they're not abandoned. You're not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Tell somebody they're not destroyed. I got my brother, my brother Bobby Evans Sr. back here. It's good to see you this morning. I remember one of our... Uh, give him and the others. We got some others who here this morning I welcome who... Sometimes it's not always easy to get here on a Sunday morning. We're glad that you're here. And, and I know there's many who are joining us online who are not able to be here every Sunday. And we welcome your presence and we do recognize that you're with us as well. But Bobby, I, was, I, I don't know if you remember, I was back in the end of the winter. I was visiting you one day and, and this is when Farmville was going on another state title basketball run. 
We, we've had some good basketball teams, haven't we, here? And so he was, we were talking about it. He said, yeah, I think they got a good shot, but we'll see what Larry can do. And, um, he, and then he started telling me the story about the 2016 Farmville Central High School basketball team. And he said, you need to go online. He said, go on that YouTube and look it up and watch that game. And he said, you won't believe it. He said, they're going to be down by 14 points, and they're going to win by 10 and so I sure enough, later that afternoon, I got back to the office and I went on YouTube and I typed it in and I found it from 20, way back in 20, six years ago, 2016. And sure enough, they were playing uh, East Lincoln for the 2A state title over at the Dean Dome. And, um, <laughs> and they were down by 14 points. It looked like Larry was going to pull his hair out there on the sideline. And Misty, Misty would probably agree that that's probably happened a time or two. And... Um, and they were just getting punched. I mean, not physically, but just, I mean, East Lincoln was just going off on them. And they were, that hardship, they, you could say Ed, in that game, they were pressed on every side. They were crushed, being crushed. They were being persecuted, struck down. But you know what? They had resilience. They had the ability to fight back because they had been through it before. If you follow uh, Farmville Central High School uh, basketball team, you'll notice that their coach and their coaching staff puts them in some tournaments during the year, during the holiday season, there are various tournaments. There's the John Wall Tournament in Raleigh where these big teams come from out of state and other places, I mean, that are loaded. And Farmville Central High goes over there and, and gives them about all they can handle. So, sometimes they lose those games. Sometimes they win those games. But it's, it's in those hardships that true character is, is revealed. It's in those hardships and those losses that the team learns what they need to work on. So brothers and sisters, hardships come our way, don't they? We can't stop hardships from coming our way, but we can allow them to reveal in us the ways that we need to grow. Almost, e almost every uh, college football team or basketball team that wins the championship at the end goes through hardships. It's like that in all areas of life. And resilience is a characteristic that has grown in hardships. The verse continues here in verse 10. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. As those who follow Jesus Christ, we know that the path of love and service and sacrifice is the path that we're called to journey. And we do so in taking up our cross. At Luke 9, 23 through 25, Jesus says to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? I find it again and again in life when the hardships come or hardships come to someone else and I'm in a pastoral care type setting and I'm giving encouragement. When those hardships come, they always reveal the places that we need to grow. Did anybody um, have any leaks during that hurricane rain we had recently? Anybody? A leak here or there? You know, when, when, a hur when, when, when the hardship of a hurricane comes upon us, it shows us where there's leaks in our house, doesn't it? Usually when that rain blows at a certain angle and gets up under a, something and it comes trickling in, there's, there's a leak there or a crack there that we didn't know that was there before and we need to repair. Same thing happens in our lives. When we go through a hard time, a hard season, the Lord always shows us places and ways that we need to grow and it helps us become more resilient. See, our response, though, in the hard times, our first response isn't always the best response, is it? So yesterday I started having that when I, you know, sometimes after we shoot and stuff, I'll have that little bit of ringing. Even when I use the, the you know, the, the earmuffs and everything, the, the plugs. Um, but when I realized it was persisting, last night before bed, ask Gina, I look like a, you ever had like a dog or it's got like something stuck in his teeth and they're like freaking out trying to get it? I know you've seen that, Julia. You know, or, or, you know, 
the got ear problems and you're scratching out. That's what I looked like. I was like, I got to get this sound out of my ear. Okay? Um, our first response isn't always the best response, is it? <laughs> I had to start figuring out, you know, I started, got on Google. Okay, that's not always the best thing to Google your medical problems, though, is it? Okay? But I decided I got to find out some answer to this. I, got, I need to sleep tonight. Homecoming's tomorrow. And I said, Lord, if you're going to let me go through this, I'm going to use it. So I put it in the sermon for today. I hope that's all right with you. Our first response in hard times are not always the best responses, but they don't define us. Okay? Hardship comes your way, and sometimes our first response isn't the best response. You don't have to be defined by your first response to it. We are often defined by our next step, third step, fourth step, 300th step. When hardships are revealers, they show us the path to go with Jesus, and Jesus will always show us how to follow him. And it is gonna it is gonna involve us laying ourselves down. It is gonna involve us putting other people first. It is gonna be the path of love, uh, of of service and of sacrifice. But here, here's what I've noticed. And again, I said, God, if you're gonna let me have an earring, not an earring, but an earring, I'm gonna use it. I found in the past 24 hours that the the worst place for me to be is a place that is dead quiet. Think about that for a moment. The worst place to be is the place where I think I can just get away from everything and everybody. I woke up this morning and I went out to the sun porch and I was, I was, I, it was just driving me nuts and I felt disoriented. I was like, I got to get this ring out of my ear. So I was like, I'm going to go in there and just sit and I'm going to pray. And I just sat in the silence and it just became deafening and deafening and deafening and deafening. So what I started doing is I started talking to God out loud. Okay, I started filling, the, filling my, my sun porch with my voice talking to God, and it got a whole lot better. Okay? And then as my family woke up, and Luke and Levi started talking, and yeah, you know how they do wrestling first thing. And Gina started talking to me, and, and you know, the dogs were wanting to get fed, so they're whining a little bit. All of these noises started making my experience a whole lot better. Better And then coming up here to church and talking to you guys and having conversations with you. And I had a little earplug. I don't know if you knew, noticed me pull it out during the music. I was going to try to use it for playing the music. But with it in there, it blocked out the noise, which caused the ringing to be even louder in my ear. So I couldn't hear. You see where I'm going with this? The worst place, maybe you don't, but let me get you there. <laughs> the worst place that we can be in our spiritual journey is to do it alone. Okay? That might be the, what we think is the easiest place, but it never leads us to growth. That's the beautiful thing about a homecoming Sunday is we get to be together and we feel that joy of being among brothers and sisters. If you choose to stay away, to stay in the quiet, to stay out of fellowship, you might think you have peace, but eventually that peace will become deafening. You'll get so alone. You are created for relationship. And we were created with the capacity to be resilient. I don't know what your past has looked like, but I know that if you follow Jesus in your future, no matter what you face, you can do so with joy and with brothers and sisters to support you. Our church exists today because brothers and sisters before us were resilient, and our future will be built upon the resiliency that we show every day every year, for the decades ahead. As we close this morning and a claim comes back to us, we're going to sing a song that is very familiar to us, and you've probably heard the story of Amazing Grace before. It was written in 1772 by English Anglican clergyman and poet John Newton. Newton wrote the words from personal experience. He grew, out, grew up without any particular religious conviction, but his life's path was formed by a variety of twists and coincidences that were often put into motions by others' reactions to what they took as him being insubordinate. So he was pressed into service with the Royal Navy, and after leaving service, he became involved in the Atlantic slave trade. In 1748, a violent storm battered his vessel off the coast of Ireland so severely that he called out to God for mercy. While this moment marked his spiritual conversion, 
It took him a while to leave the slave trade behind. So he, in this experience, he, he penned the words, the lyrics to Amazing Grace. I want you to just close your eyes for a moment and just imagine being in that experience, being in a, a horrible storm, a hardship that's come upon your life that you can't control and you're wondering, what do I do in this, Lord? Let's remember the words of John Newton that we're about to sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. When he goes on to say, it was, gra- it was grace that taught my heart to fear, and it was grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. This morning, as you worship the Lord, and as we get ready to sing this song, you may have been a Christian for nearly a century, or you may be very new in this relationship, or maybe you're questioning, how do I start it? In whatever way you come, let me tell you that God opens His arms wide to you. This morning as we sing and as we worship and as we proclaim His amazing grace, I want to give you an opportunity to respond if you need to do so. If you want to, perhaps today you say, you know what, I know it's homecoming and I hadn't planned on this or thought about it, but today's the day I want to become a member of this church. We welcome you. Maybe today is the day you say, you know what, I think I've been making steps with Jesus, but I don't know for sure. Let's make sure we, that, that you leave here on good footing and you know where you stand with the Lord. Maybe you've made a profession of faith and you haven't been baptized before. And you say, you know what, I want to take that step of baptism. Jesus did it himself, and it's an outward symbol of this inward commitment that I've made. Now is the time. And whatever way you come this morning, I want to invite you to come. I'll be down here at the front to receive you. Now I ask you to stand as we sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
Amen. Well, once again, we are so glad to have had this time of worship uh, together. I do want to remind you that in, in a few moments as we uh, depart this place, do uh, uh, watch out for those um, who are trying to maneuver through the, san- uh, through the sanctuary to get to the fellowship hall um, who might need assistance. Um, and uh, I do want to have a blessing now for the food. So if you would uh, bow your heads with me, we'll do so. Father, we thank you so much for uh, your amazing grace. We thank you for the capacity that you have put within us uh, to have resiliency, to be able to grow through hardships and, and difficult times, to be able to spring back And we thank you that our church has experienced that for 113 years. We pray that we'll experience it weekly. We pray like the early church we read from earlier that we will continue to do those things and be defined by the fellowship and the love that was given to us through Jesus Christ as uh, we share that gospel with our community, with our world, and live it uh, together. And and, uh, we pray that that the the future of our church will continue to be bright as we shine uh, the light of Jesus around us. Uh, We pray now that you would also bless this food that we are about to enjoy. We pray that you would, uh, more than blessing that food to the nourishment of our bodies, bless our fellowship together uh, to this family of faith. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. And may you go in peace. Amen.